everybody and thank you for joining tonight. This is your host Nino inviting you to a non-review. Yeah, you heard that right. Of Let Over Lambda by Doug Hoyt. Copyright 2008. Which I think more properly would be named The Pretentious Guide to Being a Lisp Hole. See, the thing is, this book is so full of opinions and and so full of itself that it is hard to bear to read it. And I just simply cannot recommend it in any way. It is a very famous book on macros, but you do not get all that much information from it in the sense of, you know, clear discussion, clear examples, and so on. It is also completely full of opinions of how wonderful Lisp is, how everything turns and rotates around Lisp. I mean, <laughs> you know, half-truths such as here, where he says, you know, recursive expansions, and that, however, as Alan Kay says, Lisp isn't a language, it is a building material. Uh, you know, there's also the quote that Lisp is a ball of mud. Eh? And then there's also in particular in regard to common Lisp, the criticism already from the 1980s, whether it even is still a Lisp-like language or whether it didn't just kill off creativity by simply trying to have been everybody's darling. And what I mean with hard to bear, you can just see on the neighboring page. Here, for instance, second, yeah? Uh, the second approach is to point the student to the common Lisp function second and ignore Kadar altogether. Both Kadar and second accomplish the same task, retrieving the second element of a list. The difference is that second is named for what it does, and Kadar is named for how it does it. Kadar is transparently specified, while second is an easy to remember name for the function. It undesirably obscures the meaning of the operation. <sighs> and here he footnotes, okay, that may not be quite so wrong, particularly because second is exactly the same as Kadar. You can't use it to get the second elements of other sequences like vectors. I mean, you know, while you're talking of that, you might as well mention that you're having there the function ELT for element, which will work on lists and on vectors, but that the null indexing, like the zero indexing, like zeroth element is the first element, is not helpful given that the function is called second, but you would call it with an ELT of one. You know, like, <laughs> that, that I see as a bigger contradiction, but the entire book is like in that style. And on page 100, 708, let me point out that too. <sighs> you are also having here, Lisp is not functional. One of the most common mischaracterizations of Lisp is calling it a functional programming language. Oh man, this is just such his own opinion and there are so many other books which are calling it differently and it was one of the first opportunities to do functional programming compared to the stuff you were forced to do in Fortran I just don't even know where to start and it is somewhat not unironic that later on here on page 187 where he's talking about Pandoric macros Warning you of Pandora's box. He takes a slight detour through Lisp in Small Pieces by Christian K. Neck. Now, the funny thing is Lisp in Small Pieces is, in fact, a book on scheme. It's not actually a book on common Lisp. And it is also such a book so full of it itself. 
like <laughs> it, it, it's really hard to bear like it is another one of those books where you have the feeling they were kissing the mirror all day long instead of trying to really get information across to you concisely and easily and if you do wonder what is also pandoric about the whole situation i mean that's actually quite easy because you plunge yourself into unnecessary bureaucracy essentially and then, while you're paying attention to all the crummy side effects and special rules that you created and where you ventured in, uh, you realize that um, uh, this whole becomes very complex to manage. But instead of drawing your evident lesson just to keep things simple, you are just drawing the lesson that you're now permitted to feel particularly smug about yourself. But you know, I have to give it to him. He remains sincere. <laughs> like, down here with languages to avoid, he does mention that uh, everything in this appendix, indeed this entire book, must be considered my opinion. Yes, indeed, that is how it is considered. And everything he likes, somehow he attributes to Lisp in the strangest fashion. Like for instance here, where he writes that Chuck Moore, the inventor of fourth, I mean why is fourth in small letters? If anything, fourth should be all caps because he he was working on such a machine where he was having um, similar limitations. So, okay, but fourth is somehow written in small letters because we're so different and special from everyone else. And that fourth leads to Lisp. I mean, does it though? Fourth was invented in 1970 when Lisp was already well entrenched. So, no, I don't actually think that fourth leads to Lisp. And, you know, all the book is like that. So, Uh, oh, before I before I conclude this, like the Haskell bit is great. I think this really demonstrates the attitude you will meet throughout this book. Haskell is an exciting, innovative language that is shaping how people think about programming. Not learning Haskell means depriving yourself of some of the most interesting research in blub languages today. Ha ha! Now we get a little bit of cynicism here. But the most important reason to gain experience with Haskell is to educate yourself on just how little static type systems actually contribute to productive programming, even ones as unobtrusive as, and extensible as Haskell's. Certainly if you are proving theorems on monadic types or researching category type theory, fancy type systems are essential, but for the vast majority of programming, such type systems look a lot be better on paper than they actually are. Haskell is an enormous success. It has proven that static typing is a failure. And so on and so forth. Like, this is unbearable. Fun part is that somewhere here, I forgot where, he was also arguing that it is Lisp macros that make Lisp fast, which was a moment I just wanted to slam the book shut. But one of the fun things is that when you try to make your code faster, one of the unequivocal advice you're getting throughout every Lisp book is to declare the types of the used functions and variables. And that this really gives the compiler sufficient hints to optimize things. So while he's so full of himself regarding uh, his macros, for some reason he, he somehow completely chooses to ignore that declaring types indeed may make code faster. The one thing where declaring types really gets into your way is that if you change things more fundamentally, you may have to change the type de definitions across a dozen of other functions, which no longer quite pan out the way you, you devise them, which is gruesomely annoying, but on the other hand, also helps keeping your program more correct. So that battle I don't see quite yet as decided. And 
for these reasons, basically, if you want to have a very proud guys guide to list macros and droning of own opinion throughout the several hundred pages book, then let over Lambda is for you. But if you really want to learn about macros in a reasonable way and, you know, look at Lisp in cold blood with an, with equilibrium, then I really would urge you to read something else where you just read about macros and do not need to be baptized in parentheses. And with that, thank you for having joined today. If you have been properly infuriated by my review, please understand that um, I won't even contradict you, but this is now my opinion. Like, he has his, I have mine, I find this terrible. And would be happy if you join again. I wish you a wonderful time. Hope you have a great day. And from me, goodbye.